Imagine you're a fisherman on a calm, shallow lake, maybe 10 feet deep at most. It's a peaceful Thursday morning. Suddenly, you hear a series of loud, metallic pops from a nearby oil rig. You watch, confused, as the massive structure, a steel platform sitting in the water, begins to tilt. Within minutes, it's swallowed by the lake, but it doesn't stop there. The lake itself begins to drain like a bathtub with the plug pulled, forming a giant, terrifying whirlpool that starts to pull your small boat in. This isn't a scene from a disaster movie. This was the reality on Lake Penur, Louisiana, on November 20th, 1980, when a tiny drilling mistake caused an entire lake and everything on and around it to vanish into the earth. How can 3.5 billion gallons of water, a whole ecosystem, and 65 acres of land disappear in just three hours? The answer lies deep beneath the placid surface of the water, in a story of incredible power, catastrophic error, and miraculous survival. To really get what happened, you first have to understand the place. Before that day, Lake Penure was an idyllic spot in southern Louisiana. It was a modest, freshwater body, averaging only about 10 feet deep, which made it a beloved spot for local fishermen and families. Its shores were famously beautiful, home to the lush live oak gardens, a botanical marvel on the adjacent Jefferson Island. This island wasn't surrounded by sea, but was one of five coastal salt domes, huge geologic formations that pushed the land high above the flat marshland nearby. For all intents and purposes, Lake Penure was a picture of serene, natural beauty. But this peaceful surface masked a hidden, industrial world. For over 60 years, since 1919, the Diamond Crystal Salt Company had been running an enormous mine directly beneath the lake bed. This wasn't just a small tunnel, it was a colossal underground complex. Miners had carved out immense caverns, some as wide as a highway and as tall as an eight-story building. They left behind massive pillars of solid salt to support the ceilings of the multiple levels which reached down to 1,500 feet. It was an underground city of salt, a hub of activity completely invisible to the fishermen casting their lines just a few hundred feet above. And if that combination of a placid lake and a cavernous mine wasn't strange enough, a third layer was added to the mix. Texaco, the oil giant, had leased the rights to drill in the area, convinced that oil was trapped in the rock around the salt dome. They brought in a drilling contractor, Wilson Brothers, who positioned a 150-foot-tall drilling platform right in the middle of the lake. Their goal was to thread a needle, to sink a well into the earth to search for oil, navigating the narrow, uncertain space between the bottom of the shallow lake and the roof of the vast, hollowed-out mine below. Three separate worlds, the recreational lake, the industrial mine, and the exploratory oil rig, were occupying the same space, separated by just a few hundred feet of earth and salt. It was a delicate balance that was about to be shattered by a single 14-inch drill bit. On the morning of November 20th, 1980, it was business as usual for the crew on the Texaco rig. Their massive 14-inch drill was biting its way into the earth beneath the lake. The process was routine, until it wasn't. Around 1,230 feet down, the drill suddenly and inexplicably seized up. The crew knew something was wrong. They expected to hit salt, but not for another 100 feet or so. A stuck drill is a common, if expensive, problem in the oil business, but this felt different. As the crew struggled to free the bit, they heard a series of loud, sharp, popping sounds coming from deep below. The sounds were unsettling, unnatural. Then, the ultimate sign of danger, the colossal platform, a structure never meant to move at all, began to tilt. The impossible was happening. The crew didn't hesitate. They knew the universal law of the oil field. When the rig starts moving in a way it's not supposed to, you get off. They scrambled to evacuate, fleeing for the safety of the shore just as their massive steel platform began its final, horrifying plunge. From the shoreline, witnesses and fishermen could only watch in horror. The ten-foot-deep lake swallowed the entire rig whole. Where the platform had stood moments before, the surface of the water began to dimple. This small depression grew with astonishing speed, spinning faster and faster until it transformed into a terrifying vortex. One fisherman, who had to gun his small boat to shore to escape, described the sound of the water as a deafening roar. The whirlpool's power was immense. It began to consume everything. First, it pulled in another nearby drilling platform. Then, it turned its attention to the shore. Eleven heavy-laden barges, moored at a loading dock, were ripped from their moorings and sucked into the spinning chaos like toys in a bathtub. They were followed by a powerful tugboat which fought against the current until its crew had no choice but to leap onto the canal bank and watch their vessel get consumed. 
But the vortex wasn't just swallowing things on the water, it was eating the land itself. Huge chunks of Jefferson Island, 65 acres in total, were torn away, calving into the lake with a thunderous crash. Trees, trucks, a parking lot, and even a house slid into the ever-widening maw. In less than three hours, the 3.5 billion gallons of water that made up Lake Pinure had vanished, pulled down into the earth through a hole that should never have existed. While chaos reigned on the surface, a different kind of drama was unfolding 1,300 feet underground. For the 55 miners of the Diamond Crystal Salt Company, the day had started like any other. They descended into the vast, dry, and eerily quiet caverns to start their shift. The mine was their world, a familiar landscape of towering salt pillars and cathedral-like chambers. The first sign that something was terribly wrong wasn't a sound of collapse, but the sight of water. A miner noticed a trickle of muddy water flowing down a tunnel wall where no water should ever be. This trickle quickly grew into a stream, and then a torrent. The mine's electrician saw the flood and immediately hit the evacuation alarm, a decision that undoubtedly saved every life in the mine that day. Panic could have easily set in, but the miners' discipline and training took over. They knew this was a race against the water. As the lights flickered and failed, they made their way through the darkening, labyrinthine tunnels toward the primary elevator shaft, their only way out. The water was now a waist-deep, churning flood, rising with terrifying speed. The miners knew their mine was huge, but they couldn't possibly guess the source of the deluge. They were being flooded by an entire lake. They could hear the groan and screech of the salt pillars, the very supports of their world, beginning to dissolve and give way under the immense pressure of the water pouring in. They reached the elevator and began the orderly, painfully slow process of ascending to the surface, one group at a time. Each trip was a gamble against the rising flood and the failing structure of the mine. Incredibly, thanks to their practiced emergency drills and calm execution, every single one of the 55 miners made it out of the shaft alive, emerging into the daylight to see the nightmare unfolding above them. They had escaped from a collapsing, flooding tomb with mere minutes to spare. The fact that every single miner and rig worker escaped is nothing short of a miracle, a testament to quick thinking and training. The rest of the story, however, is a testament to the sheer, unbelievable power of nature when unleashed by human error. We're about to explore the bizarre aftermath, including a waterfall that shouldn't exist and a lake that came back from the dead. If you're finding this story as incredible as I do, please take a moment to subscribe to the channel. It's a small click for you, but it makes a huge difference in our ability to bring you more tales of these mind-bending true events. With the lake completely drained into the mine, what was left was a vast, gaping, muddy crater. The disaster, it seemed, was over. But in reality, the most surreal part was just beginning. The lake was connected to the Gulf of Mexico, 12 miles away, by a waterway called the Del Cambre Canal. For its entire existence, this canal had one job, to drain fresh water out of Lake Penure and into a nearby bay. But now, with the lake empty and its bottom sitting far below sea level, the laws of physics took over. The Del Cambre Canal reversed its flow. For the first and only time in history, salt water from the Gulf of Mexico began to flow north, inland, into the empty lake bed. This created something Louisiana had never seen before, a massive waterfall. As the Gulf water poured into the chasm, it created a roaring 164-foot-tall waterfall, temporarily the highest in the entire state. For two full days, the Gulf of Mexico poured into the hole, refilling the void. When the water pressure finally equalized, the transformed Lake Penure was born. It was no longer a shallow, 10-foot-deep freshwater lake. It was now a deep, brackish, saltwater abyss, with new depths reaching 200 feet, making it the deepest lake in Louisiana. The disaster had permanently and irrevocably changed the very nature of the landscape. The ecosystem was completely rewritten. Freshwater plants died off, replaced by saltwater vegetation. The fish that had once called the lake home were gone, replaced by new species that rode in with the tide from the ocean. In a final, bizarre twist, days after the event, Nine of the eleven sunken barges that had been swallowed by the vortex suddenly popped to the surface, bobbing in the new, deep lake like strange metal corks. The other two, along with the tugboat and the oil rig, remain entombed in the flooded mine below to this day. So, how did this all happen? How did a single drill bit trigger such a disastrous domino effect? The official investigation stopped short of assigning a definitive cause, since most of the evidence was washed away. However, the sequence of events points to a catastrophic but simple error in measurement. 
The concept is a lot like pulling the plug in a bathtub. The 14-inch drill bit, a tiny point relative to the size of the lake, punctured the roof of the salt mine. It's widely believed that the drilling crew was working with a flawed coordinate system, a miscalculation that placed their drill site directly over a mine shaft when they thought they had a safe margin. Once the breach occurred, water from the lake began pouring into the mine. This is where the unique geology of the salt dome became critical. Water is the enemy of salt. As the freshwater cascaded into the mine, it rapidly dissolved the massive salt pillars holding up the roof. As these pillars weakened and dissolved, the structural integrity of the entire mine failed. The roof of the mine collapsed, creating a massive sinkhole on the lake bed above. The initial 14-inch hole grew exponentially as the salt around it eroded, turning a small leak into a full-blown drain for the entire lake. The sheer force of the water rushing into the sealed mine caverns also created immense air pressure, which then erupted out of the mine's other shafts as a 400-foot geyser of air, mud, and water. It was a perfect storm of engineering failure and geological vulnerability, a case study in how a small mistake can have almost unimaginable consequences. The Lake Penure disaster is one of the most bizarre and spectacular industrial accidents in history. In just a few hours, a landscape was completely redrawn. A shallow freshwater fishing spot became Louisiana's deepest saltwater lake. An entire ecosystem was erased and replaced. Tens of millions of dollars in equipment, including a drilling rig, a tugboat, and 11 barges, were lost. The financial toll was immense. Texaco and its drilling contractor eventually paid out a $32 million settlement to the Diamond Crystal Salt Company and another $12.8 million to the owners of the Live Oak Gardens. Yet, for all the breathtaking destruction, the most astonishing fact is this, not a single human life was lost. The quick thinking of the rig crew and the disciplined evacuation of the 55 miners saved every person. Tragically, three dogs belonging to a caretaker on the island were not so lucky and perished in the disaster. Today, Lake Penure is once again calm and seemingly peaceful, but it's a profoundly changed place. The water is deep and salty, its ecology forever altered, and for visitors who know where to look, a single haunting reminder of the event still stands. The brick chimney of a swallowed house, protruding from the water's surface like a lone tombstone. A silent monument to the day the earth opened up and an entire lake went down the drain.